Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High, we're checking out a sweet new tenant at the North Market. A lot of people just want plain chocolate. Well, we don't do that. Then we're stopping by the Ohio History Center to explore some dangerous curiosities. So it is glassware that has trace amounts of uranium in it. And fancy lettering that will put your penmanship to shame. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome to Broad and High. The North Market recently welcomed a new tenant. It's Coco Cat Bakery and they specialize in chocolates infused with herbs and spices, resulting in unique and creative flavor combinations. And a percentage of their proceeds are donated to local charities. Owner Melissa Camp shows us that her treats are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. We are inside the North Market. We've been here for a little over two and a half months. Coco Cat was born out of the idea that we would be raising money to help spay and neuter cats in and around our community. I love to put really crazy spices and herbs into chocolate, things that you would never ever think go with chocolate. Now these are not your normal, ordinary strawberries because they're dipped in white chocolate and dark chocolate. But then they're topped with things like toasted coconut with Jamaican curry. We have fresh rosemary and pistachio on top of dark chocolate and hibiscus and candied orange chopped up and put onto a dark chocolate a strawberry. We also have our ginger, cardamom, lime truffles. I kind of go with the flavors that I really like, like curries and particularly herbs. So we grow a lot of our herbs on our farm, um, but then we also um, have our, a lot of our spice combinations blended or purchase them directly from North Market Spices here in the market. Everything is very, very, very small batch and very handcrafted, such attention to detail. all the way to our Coco Kitty items, like Lego bricks with uh, jelly bellies in them and little emoji poops. These are the emoji poops, the biggest seller. They are made of solid chocolate. My name is Tosh and I am nine years old. Well, I told my mom that not all kids like herbs and spices in their chocolate. So they are Lego bricks filled with jelly beans and then just solid chocolate. And these are the Lego bricks. Columbus is definitely ready for all of these different combinations and they're willing to try them. That's the biggest thing. Are you willing? to try my Reckless Abandon and kind of go to the edge of what you really think chocolate could be and should be. A lot of people just want plain chocolate. Well, we don't do that. You can find Coco Cat in the North Market or check them out online at cococatbakery.com. All right, it's time for our latest installment of Artifacts. This is where we delve into the seldom seen archives of the Ohio History Center to shine a spotlight on some of our state's hidden treasures, or in this case, dangerous substances. We pop by the museum to learn more about some of the hazardous items that can be found within its collections. Hey everyone, we're 
here at the Ohio History Center. I'm with Emmy Beach, and she's going to tell us a little bit about their dangerous collections. So tell me where we are right now, what's happening. So we are in the Decorative Arts Gallery at the Ohio History Center. This is where we have a lot of our pottery collections, a lot of our glassware. Okay, so none of that sounds really dangerous. <laughs> What's the uh, angle there? Wow, you'd be surprised. So we have a really uh, fun collection that I always like to point visitors to. It is glassware that has trace amounts of uranium in it. So uranium is a radioactive element that was used in the creation and is still used in the creation of nuclear weapons. I don't know that I'd want that in my home, but it, it's not that bad, right? It's really not bad. You know, um, we're exposed to low levels of radiation every single day from going out into the sun, mm -hmm. from even drinking tap water. Wow. And this, you could argue, has less radiation than those types of sources. And this was popular primarily in the 1920s and the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Production on it completely stopped during World War II. Uranium was really tightly regulated of during course. that time. And Kate, if you want to see some of these uranium glass pieces that we have in our collection here at the Ohio History Center, we can go and take a look. Let's do it. I love it. Cool. All right, Kate. So there's a couple pieces of uranium glass in our collection here. Okay. And I brought a special little tool with me. Ooh. One of the cool things about uranium glass is that it glows under a black light. So here's one. See if you can spot it there. It's glowing. That's pretty That's cool. That's crazy. Isn't that neat? Look at that. Fun museum party trick. I Totally. <laughs> and then there's one up here. Look at that big one. Two. The, the chemistry of the uranium is what makes it glow, not radiation. The next time you're in the museum, just bring your your everyday black light. BYO black light flashlight. Yeah, as you do. <laughs> right. And then check out our uranium glass. Very cool. Okay, so I really, really enjoyed the uranium glass. Yeah. Do you have other dangerous collections happening? We do. They're kind of scattered throughout the Ohio History Center, but you know, want to come with me, we'll take a look. Let's do it. Awesome. All right, Emmy, I see you brought us to the World War I gallery, and I'm curious as to what our friend has here and what might be dangerous about it. Oh, sure. Well, I'm here with Andrew Hall. He's here holding one of our World War I helmets. Um, asbestos was used widely during World War I when they were making these helmets. Um, it was used to provide strength without a lot of weight. We really didn't know that asbestos was bad for us until the 1960s. You know, we keep them in these bags like Andrew is holding. We, we wear gloves when we handle them. It protects our employees. Um, and it Thank also, you for risking your life for Broad and High. <laughs> it also protects the visitors. So we can learn about these safely from the museum floor without you know, any, any risk to our health. You'll find asbestos specifically in uh, the filter of these gas masks. So this part right here. That's unfortunate. Yeah. So, so they and, were breathing asbestos. Essentially, but you know, in the moment, they were protecting themselves from things like mustard gas, sure. which you know uh, was thought it's a higher to be priority a at higher the time. priority. Yeah. All right, so this gas mask was spooky, definitely dangerous. Do you have more to show us on the in the dangerous collections? Yeah, we got one more thing to show you. It should be really fun, great, and dangerous. So we are in the natural history area, and we're looking at, as you can see, a lot of taxidermied animals. And uh, what's dangerous about these collections is that they're all, many of them, are preserved with arsenic. Arsenic was a common chemical used in the preservation of natural history collections. Before we had arsenic, they were using salt. Arsenic came along in the 18th century and it was really used up until the 1970s. And it was also effective in preventing insects from attacking these, wow. these mounts. My favorite piece, and one of the most eye-catching pieces, is this Victorian fire screen. It would have been placed in front of the fireplace of a Victorian household during the summer months to kind of hide that area and, and make the room look a little more decorative. Slightly dangerous, but very a interesting. A little dangerous, but as you'll notice, they're all behind glass, mm -hmm. and, and the levels of arsenic are, are pretty minimal. Sure. Um, you know, we, when we handle them, we wear gloves, um, and again, we keep them behind glass so that there's no danger to any of our visitors. Well, this is fascinating. Thank you so much for educating me about this dangerous collection. Absolutely. It's been an exciting day. See it for yourself. Take a tour of the museum's dangerous collections on Sunday, March 25th. Visit ohiohistory.org to learn more. 
While it seems that cursive writing among young people is on the decline, there are still those devoted to script lettering, like Columbus artist and calligraphy instructor Ann Woods. Here's her story. When I started the class, I said, why do you, what, what do you hope to get out of this class and why did you want to take it? And um, some, it was because they had the memory of the beautiful handwriting of their parents or their grandparents. And they wanted to know how you got there and, and how, you know, how was that done? Uh, some had had a little bit of that, but you know, it's so far back. Um, and then others, um, really just want to, they're curious about calligraphy, they like to write, um, and they like the, 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 what's happening now with the decorative forms, and they want to be able to do it, and they want to be able to use the tools, they want to apply it to their lives. You know, when I began, I started doing it because um, I wanted to do it, and then I suddenly discovered people wanted my work. Nothing makes you more feel more more needed, more loved, more anything than something you created made people happy. And, and obviously people are made happy by beautiful handwriting. I had spent a year as a student in Italy um, studying ancient and medieval history. And I was looking at manuscripts in all the libraries and looking at this stuff. I, I have the images in my head, but I didn't know what I was looking at. So when it fell into place when I started learning about it, that's what happened. So. Um, I have since, when I teach handwriting, I start with the basic italic forms. When we learn cursive today, the tradition is you learn manuscript, which is straight up and down. It's like ball and strict. And then at second grade or third grade, they tell the students, oh, just forget all that you learned. We taught you that for two years. Just forget that. And now we want you to do this angled thing that's joined all the way through. We find that after two years, of, even one year, of being away from the constant training of the cursive, they go back to the printing, because that's what they learned first, and because that seems to be more efficient. I abandoned cursive and went back to printing in college, because I couldn't write that fast enough. It broke down. I couldn't read my notes. So I went back to printing with a slight slant. And then when I discovered calligraphy, I said, oh, now I can turn my print into a handwriting. So that's what I did here. They learn the basic italic, they're learning the basic script, and then see how you can mine them both for something you want to create for yourself. Good handwriting is based on those consistencies and uh, you know, the logic of keeping an alphabet consistent. We were given a brain to sort things out and, and, and make, make logic out of it. So when you learn an alphabet, this is one of the first things I was taught, is there's an inner logic to these alphabets that connects the, all the forms within it. That's why it creates the patterns it does, the beauty of it. And so that's what you need to know. Why doesn't my handwriting look like that? Well, because you haven't learned the inner patterns of it, the inner consistencies of it. Because what you're trying to do is say, where do you begin this stroke and how do you make it consistent? So if you know, within thirds, say, of a space, where you're supposed to begin that stroke, then it will be consistently the same. It will, it will have the same appearance. I'm teaching their eyes to see the relationships, and that's a, that's a, a pattern, right? It's a rhythm. It's beat, da, da, beat, you see? And so it has music in it, too, and of course that's another part of our human you know, baggage is that it's the beauty of rhythm and music that, and dance that actually uh, inform it, calligraphy um, and make it something just endlessly interesting. Interested in learning more about calligraphy? There's a group for that. Check out the Calligraphy Guild of Columbus on Facebook. And speaking of good penmanship, the tradition of giving your sweetheart a written note on February 14th dates back way before Hallmark. In fact, the oldest valentine on record is a poem written in the 1400s. 
but the mass-produced factory-made cards that we're familiar with today have a much more recent past. They've only been around since the 19th century, when they started to replace all those handmade and handwritten love notes. I recently met with local collector George Johnson in Lancaster to talk about how this tradition has evolved through the ages. George, so you're a bit of a Valentine historian in a way, right? Yes. So tell me about your collection. How did you get started with this? I started collecting in the 1970s, and I, I really admired the artwork and the, you know, how, how lovely they were. I started collecting what collectors today call fold-down Valentines that, that pull down and open up oh, cool. into beautiful scenes. Mm -hmm. You weren't just going to the drugstore and buying valentines. No, How no. are you finding these? I was buying them at antique shows mm -hmm. and antique shops, and places like that, you know, flea markets. A lot of times valentines have been saved for many, many years. I have several in the collection that are all 200 years old wow. and still in good shape. Do you have any concept of how many you've collected? I mean, how your collection has grown over the years? Um, not really. <laughs> But there's probably two, three hundred um, wow. Valentines on display here. So and much love, <laughs> it's kind of great. That's right. This particular one is the earliest one that we have uh, in the collection. So this one is essentially, you know, 200 years old. Wow. On the back, then, is the handwritten. That's handwritten. Poem. Our penmanship skills have gone yes. down. <laughs> I like this, many waters cannot quench love. This one, it dates from the 1840s, and um, it has perforated lace on it, it has satin in the center, and it's a very lovely card, but the most interesting part, at least to me, is that each of these wreaths, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and each of these will lift to reveal a little, little message, message mm -hmm. behind it. That's so cute. And everyone, except Sunday, because Sunday, Sunday is for church, and church we're and not gonna do any right. of that. <laughs> hanky panky type stuff. <laughs> and these little envelopes? And then each one of the six days of the week, that are listed here, wow. has a little tiny envelope. That doesn't open. And it opens. Oh, stop. And inside is another small message. handwritten message. Um, this one is from the 1870s, probably, <sighs> and uh, it's, it's gilded, perforated lace paper. It's very unusual in the sense that the back is just as decorated oh my gosh, as the front. It is. With a, um, uh, that's a spun glass um, medallion what? in it. That's amazing. And then this is the hidden picture. Okay. You want to take that other side, we'll open it up. To see There's the a little picture couple. On the inside. Running away together. So this is a, what they call the trick valentine. So we've got a little silk cord with a little piece of uh, silvered um, cardboard on it. And when you pull the string, it lifts up into a three-dimensional form with a little love note at That's the top. That's beautiful. How elaborate. And let oh go of it and it lays flat. So it'll go through the mail like that. Right. And then, you know, simply pulling the string. And what era is this from? This again is probably 1870s, maybe wow. 1880s. So intricate. The majority of the display here runs from 1820 to um, 1930s, 40s, mm -hmm. um, but there's a few that, you know, younger kids will recognize too. Our final story tonight takes us to Minneapolis, where an artist there describes himself as a grown man who draws animals with robot parts, hairy worn things, and astronauts for a living. You be the judge. 
Hogarth! Hogarth, come! We're here. Sit. Sit down. I've always loved animals, so I always drew animals a lot. I just kept adding stuff to them. It's like, oh, I think this cat would look better in an astronaut outfit, or this dog would look better with robot legs. Just why not kind of stuff. Like, uh, it, there was no like rhyme or reason to it. It was just stuff that I thought would look cool. Well, I've always been interested in art ever since I was a little kid. When I was in high school, I got really into graffiti and got arrested a bunch of times. And my mom was like, find a legal way to do these things. So I ended up going to, to art school for graphic design. I ended up meeting like a lot of local rappers, a lot of local graffiti artists, just kind of like got really into the hip hop scene here. And I started doing like flyers for different bands uh, and album covers and stuff like that. I kind of just fell into the whole music festival thing by designing all the work for the Bella Music Festival. And uh, the organizer invited me to do some live painting down there. And then from there, I started reaching out to other bigger festivals. So when we go to these festivals, like we set up like a little, like, like a 10 by 10 tent. Just like a, a tiny gallery in the middle of the, this big music festival. Outside my booth, I'll set up an easel with a canvas and I'll, I'll just kind of work on it throughout the festival. These festivals are amazing, like over 100,000 people there. There's people from all over the world. They come in buy posters, so it's awesome. Traveling to these festivals like, is what has like, allowed me to do what I want to do. My own work actually pays more than doing work for other people at this point. Six or 07 is kind of when drippy graffiti work kind of started to get more refined with more line work. Things just didn't feel done until more lines kept being added. Uh, this is a new one that I'm trying to come up with uh, what I'm gonna do for the, the background. The, the face is based on, on my dog and the rest is like a cross between a hairless cat and a dinosaur. Like I have sketchbooks and sketchbooks full of half-finished pieces that never get done. And it's all a matter of if the inspiration sticks around until I think it's done, then I print it and make it. Just random bits and pieces. There's like some dandelions, some bits and pieces of the, uh, the sloth print. Some Indeed stuff, more Indeed roughs. Indeed Brewing is a local craft brewing company that hired me to do all their cans and most of their, their logos and stuff like that. Midnight Rider and Day Tripper were the first two. I like working with Indeed Brewery just because of like how much freedom they give me. Well, this is uh, the, the basement studio. And it's just a, a dingy basement. My, my printer is here. It's where I print all, all my prints. This was uh, the, the first one that I started really printing on my own when I got the, the, the printer. These are just a, a few of the shirt designs. This is Slothzilla. Uh, this is Sir Purrington. The t-shirts I just started doing, right now I have about six different designs and two colors for each design. The future, eventually I want to like be able to stop doing the festivals, build my t-shirt lineup and like get my stuff in stores basically. Right now, success looks like getting to do what I want to do. Like I was thinking the other day, like it's been a while that I did anything that I genuinely didn't want to do. Like I didn't even let myself dream 
that like I'd be able to make a, a living making my own art. That is it for this week's episode of Broad and High. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org. You can also find them on the WOSU public media mobile app. And of course, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing out today's show with a track called Larger Than Life by local rockers Todd and the Bad Ideas. For everyone here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. How I felt that day, the pain, the doubt, and shame. But I refuse to let them make me stumble Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.